Today on the Crispy Cast, we discuss documentaries for general talk. Then we discuss the ongoing Onision story as well as the installation of kid friendly COPA mechanisms into YouTube. And then we ended off with a length- lengthy court of review section reviewing The Mandalorian, The Witcher, and Crisis on Infinite Earths. All that on the Crispy Cast. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Crispy Cast. It has been a second since I've done one of these. We went, we went on a, a bit of a hiatus uh, over the the winter break and a little bit after the new year, but we are back, back in 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 black. Uh, I wear I wear black a lot, so I'm 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 always in black. But today is a particular day since I'm now back in black. Anyway, look, my point is is that the Crispy Cast has returned. I have no announcements, so we can basically just get right into it by talking about documentaries. And then, and yes, I'm, I'm talking about documentaries for the, uh, I don't know, am I pronouncing that right? Documentaries. I, I think I'm pronouncing that right. I, it sounds wrong when I say it. I don't know why. But over the break, uh, I got HBO, the HBO Now app. And I, well, I mainly got it so I can uh, re-watch Game of Thrones, which, I mean, yes, is a very uh, shit ending. However, uh, I really wanted to see, you know, all the good stuff. Remember it for how it was and not the abomination it became. While I was, however, uh, I needed more to do with uh, HBO than just watch that literal one show. So I was like, hey, what documentaries are on here? And I found a treasure trove of amazing documentaries. So the ones I watched, I watched Going Clear. Uh, I watched one called like uh, A Dangerous Child, and then I watched Beware the Slender Man. So those are the three, the three I watched. And then I watched, and I I was in the documentary mood, so I went on Netflix to go watch some documentaries. I think the only Netflix documentary or documentary on Netflix that I watched was um, before this break was the fire festival documentary and then i never watched another one but then this past week i watched um abducted in plain sight or kidnapped in plain sight i believe it's one of the two titles and let me tell you every single one of these is phenomenal i don't really just like watch them i kind of i look through the titles and like see what premise i think would be interesting because i mean no one wants to watch one about you know i'm well at least i don't want to say no one <laughs> What I don't like watching is, you know, very, uh, very opinionated documentaries. I like ones that just, like, tell a story. A story that's, you know, shocking and surprising. I suppose you could say I'm in it for the drama, I guess. I I love a good story, and that's what I like about these documentaries. Every single one of them, and the Fire Festival documentary, every single one of them just tells a unique and interesting story that makes you think, like, I cannot believe that this is real life. Like, the stuff that happens in these in these documentaries on HBO and Netflix and other platforms, I'm sure, are just so insane that it, uh, it boggles the mind, let me tell you. For example, the Abducted in Plain Sight documentary, I mean, that one, that one is just absurd. It involves, get this, it involves a sex offender, we're, we're back on the sex offender train, it involves a sex offender uh, kidnapping kidnapping a child and uh this girl by the way the girl now an adult is actually in the documentary which is which is really cool um when they can get when they can get people who are it's they usually documentaries are able to get people who are close to the story but i mean this is literally the person who's at the center of the whole thing and the fact that they were able to get her on there is really awesome I, i'm pretty sure she i'm pretty sure she volunteered that. i mean she wrote a book a book about the whole thing so i'm not surprised but what happened was she was abducted by the by like a family friend. She went missing and I mean, yeah, he's a sex offender. I won't describe the whole shebang because it uh, well, I mean, I I need to at least attempt to not be child friendly because of the copa laws, but but let's not go so too extreme here. What happened was in order to convince her to have intercourse with him, he he put on uh, this this uh this show. Essentially, he convinced her that she had not in fact been kidnapped by him. She had been kidnapped 
by aliens. Yes, aliens. And that in order to save... The, the, she Okay, she needed to make... She needed to essentially make the alien... She needed to be the Mary for the aliens version of Jesus. Basically, she needed to birth out like this savior baby. And if she didn't, there would be horrible consequences and all that. And immediately as she wakes up, who's the first male person she sees? The the, the, the sex offender. And he, he immediately, like, takes out all of the sex ed books and all that. And it's like this... Which is the craziest thing. Like, whoa! He convinced her, like, that aliens are out there and she needed to make, like, alien Jesus? Like, how long did he spend trying to make up this story? Anyway... So, oh man, I, I got really loud for in that past part. I am so sorry. But, um, yeah, essentially, after that, she was found. And the guy, uh, I, he got off because she wouldn't... There, no charges were pressed. He, he walked free. The parents and the girl, let, it was both of them, basically were coerced into letting him go, which pissed off the feds because, you know, they had this guy, they had him in the bag, and then the parents to just drop everything and say, oh, nothing bad happened, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it was, it was just terrible. He, he coerced them into basically letting him go. And after that, it's this whole web of con- it, it, this just whole web of craziness. He, okay, this is the craziest part. He essentially- both parents cheated on each other with the same guy, the sex offender. Yeah, I'm not, I can't even make that up. He had intercourse with both of the parents and basically blackmailed them, said, oh, if you, if you, uh, if you try to fight me, because I'm trying to, you know, hook up with your kid, if you try to fight me on that, I will expose you to your, to your spouse not knowing that he the spouse both spouses not knowing that they're cheating with the same person who's also the guy who's trying to have intercourse with their kid what that is that is insane obviously he was eventually um he was eventually caught and then uh he 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 killed himself he wasn't really caught on the charges that you know expect which is really messed up like it, it shows he was caught but he wasn't caught on um on pedophile or sex offender charges it was for something else really stupid i think he like tried to basically the girl now an adult wrote a book because at this point she is an adult and he still hasn't been brought to justice which is just i mean that's absurd um, though then again, he had a, to be fair to, like, the law system, he had a very elaborate scheme to make sure he wasn't, uh, wasn't thrown in prison. The, he, well, during this, the, she, when she released the book, she had, like, a, like, a, sh like, a show where a bunch of people showed up, and he, he showed up, and she had, oh my god, this is crazy, she had, like, a biker gang protecting her, which is, I mean, is kind of wholesome. But, uh, he, he I, I don't remember quite what happened, but he apparently hit one of them with a car, which is assault. So he went, he basically was caught on that. It was, it was a mix of that confrontation with a few other things, I think. But what's, it, what's important is that he wasn't caught on the sex offender charges. However, he knew that the world, thanks to this book that the girl made, he knew that people know that other he knew that other people know that he is a sexual predator and he i guess he figured that he'd be killed in prison anyway so he decided to kill himself which that's how his story ends but yeah i mean it is uh, i recommend that one it's on netflix i think it's still on netflix it is the craziest show the craziest documentary i mean that story is just absurd it is insane it gets it keeps on getting worse and worse and you think wow this cannot get any crazier and then it gets crazier it's the same thing with every single one there's the beware the slenderman one where you know these two kids get uh i had already heard about the story as had um most people like it was a very popular story in the internet especially since slenderman was in uh, high prevalence 
But yeah, there. If you don't know, these two kids essentially they um, they were really into like the creepy pasta community, and they were really into Slenderman, which is nothing wrong with that. I mean, being into like creepy pastas or internet myths and all that stuff. I mean, there's there's literally nothing wrong with that. Uh, parts of the documentary try to paint it like not all of it. Not all of it, and and the 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 consensus that the right, not the writers. I don't know if there's really writers, but the consensus that most of the people that are interviewed come to is that you know this is mostly a um, an issue of mental health and isolation from other people. Like that's that is what the the uh, the majority of the interviews and the research that the documentary goes into in the Beware the Slenderman, they they conclude that's mostly an issue of mental health and. Uh, and isolation from other people because when there's two people who are uh, who are convinced that something in something crazy like Slenderman existing, two people are convinced that, Slen that Slenderman exists, and there's no one around them to deny it. Like they have no other friends to talk to and and to have them see reason. There's nothing to stop them from just going all in on this belief. It's actually a really interesting study in like how belief works. But anyway. Uh, there, again, like I was saying, there's nothing wrong with with liking um, creepy pastas and all that. There are there are parts of the documentary that kind of it alluded to the fact that the internet or the 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 creepy pasta community is at least partially at fault, which I think is kind of ridiculous considering that. I mean, even then, creepy pasta and Slender Man. They're not niche communities that only a few people join. I mean, these were very, 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 very popular things to, to interact with on the internet. And there's only two people in the entire world who have attempted to commit murder for them. But anyway, if, I, I kind of spoiled the ending of the story. But yeah, these two girls, um, Anissa and... Um, Anissa and Morgan? I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names. I know one of them is named Anissa Anissa. But anyway, they they go to they go to um to a friend. No, they not they don't go. They're at uh, I think it was Morgan's house. Uh, they're celebrating a birthday and they invite a girl named Bella over. That's her nickname. Her real name's Peyton, but uh or her real first name is Peyton. This, this girl, Bella, they they take her out to the park. Now, there are conflicting... I've heard a lot about this bit. I wasn't really clear on the doc... I'm not saying the documentary didn't, didn't make it clear. I'm sure I was just, like, phasing out. But uh, they said that they... I remember them saying that they murdered her... The two girls attacked her in, the ba in a bathroom. Um, however, it said that the girl... Uh, according to a lot of people tell the story, the girl crawled out. The girl, because Bella, she survived the the attempted murder, and she crawled out of the woods. So I'm guessing it was just a, like one of those crappy bathrooms in like a park in the woods. But anyway, Anissa and Morgan, I'm gonna, just, I'm just, I'm just gonna go with that name. If I get the name wrong, I'm so sorry. I'm terrible with names. But they attack Bella, and, and they stab her, or at least one of them stabs. Well, the other one kind of watches. St they stab her. 19 times with a five inch knife which i mean whoa how did bella survive that to keep to put it in perspective these people are like 12 they're in seventh grade i i mean the seventh graders i've met in in the recent years uh certainly aren't hardy enough to survive that when i was in seventh grade i wasn't hardy enough to survive that I'm not in 7th grade anymore, and I'm still not hardy. I don't think I could take 19 stab wounds and survive. I can barely hike 8 miles. I mean, 19 stab wounds, and then she crawled her way her way away from the, 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 the scene of the crime to help, to get help, to like flag down a car. I mean, whoa, this girl is a friggin' tank, and she survived. I mean, that is incredibly uh, miraculous. But yeah, the the Be um, not Bella. She's completely. She's the she's the miraculous person. Uh, Anissa and Morgan uh, were again going with Morgan. If I get the name wrong, I, again I apologize. But they were they were caught and uh, taken to trial. And 
Right now, uh, I think I looked it up, I might still have outdated information because I didn't do extensive research into it because this is just for general talk, this isn't like a something off porch, I'm just discussing documentaries. But uh, last time I checked, one of them is like in a mental asylum, in, in a mental, I don't want to say asylum, that, that sounds like something crazy, but she's in a mental hospital for the next 25 years, and the other one is still in county prison, um, but I think they're planning on moving her to a mental hospital as well, or maybe they're they're going to transfer her over to um, to juvenile hall. I don't really know like what's going on with that. The uh, they actually showed in the documentary a call between one of the girls. I believe it was Anissa and Anissa in prison, which is crazy. I mean, she seems uh, on the call. I obviously don't know her, but on the call in this like five minute conversation. She seems so normal, right? Like, she seems just like any other quirky kid I'd meet at school, you know? She talks very fast and very excitedly. She seems like someone who um, who drinks a lot of coffee or drank a lot of coffee. She's in jail now, so I don't know if they, they serve coffee there. But she seems like someone who, who does their homework and, oh my god, my computer turned off. Please turn back on. Thank you. She seems like someone who does her homework and and is very and is very into nerd culture. I mean, she is. She she's she seem she talks very fast. She seems like people that you know you and I meet in our normal lives, and it it makes you kind of forget that she you know attempted murder <laughs> for Slenderman of all things. I mean, it's just very interesting. Anyway. That was a really interesting tangent. I've been going on for doc about documentaries for the past 16 minutes. I think I can talk about, I think I can talk about one more. Let's end it off with talking about A Dangerous Child. That's the another one I saw on HBO. That one is the most, it's, it's basically a reason, it's not about a story. It's about, I thought it was because of the title, you know, A Dangerous Child. I figured, oh, this will be like, a story about a kid who did something terrible. This could be cool, because I don't read the descriptions, because I don't like, I don't know, I see them as kind of like quote-unquote spoilers, which is kind of stupid, because they don't usually give away that much, but you know, that's just how I roll. I click on documentary, and it's more like a, it's more like a research into, uh, into kids with severe, um, anger issues. It's, I, the documentary doesn't go too much into like the scientific diagnosis, as it should. I mean, that stuff is just confusing. But um, essentially, it it to, from what I can tell, it is a combination of autism and severe anger issues that causes these children to act out in very spontaneous ways. That uh, that's that frankly is really crazy. It's more so on the side of the anger issues. Obviously, I mean, like the things that. The way that they react to very small slights uh, is kind of telling of that. There's one scene where they're just filming. They're filming this kid, and he's he's been you know in in like homes all his life because he's unable to to live with his uh, to live with his family because he's uh, continuously trying to attack them and assault them. So. Eventually, they just were like, hey, we've got to put you in a home. So he gets put in a home, and they're like, all right, hey, you're moving to the to the next step. You're moving to the next step closer to home. You're going to a different home, and if you if you succeed in managing your, your anger issues here, you can come back to your home. You can come back to us, your family. And he gets he gets really upset. Now, I, I, I sympathize. I mean, it sucks that he, he's away from his family, but it shows that the combination of not being able to really, because he doesn't really understand. Because what happened was he he storms out and starts like screaming and yelling uh, in in the streets. And then when he is when uh, when they're driving home and he's driving home with his mom, he's like screaming at her, and she's I, she's forced to call law enforcement, which is which is crazy. I mean that's insane. He. He literally cannot understand. He's unable to understand the consequences of what's happening. And I think that that is the, the deadly combination of both severe anger and not being un be able to understand the consequences of such. Because everyone gets upset, you know? Everyone gets mad. That's There's no shame or anything wrong with that. Everyone gets mad every once in a while. 
Some people get mad more often than others though, and that's where severe anger issues comes in. However, when you combine getting mad more often than other people, you know, above average anger with not being able to understand the consequences of that anger, you get a you get as that as the title states, a very dangerous, frankly dangerous child. And I think the title's a bit misleading. I mean, none of these kids have murdered anyone, though they threatened it a lot. I don't know if they'd ever go through with it. The documentary doesn't really say that. It's more like it's a research portion. It's not trying to vilify these kids. They're still kids. I mean, one of them is eight. The the guy I just talked about, he's like uh, a few years younger than me. He's like four years younger than me. Like, I mean, it's really hard to hate kids for something that's frankly out of their control. But at the same time, like seeing how they act, I, I, I don't I don't know how I'd act in that situation or react if a kid started like wailing on me for something so 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 small a slight. I don't I don't imagine I'd be in a very merciful mood. <laughs> I think I'd actually be quite upset, as would I think a lot of people, because that's what people do when they get attacked. But yeah, I also recommend that one. All three of those documentaries are top tier. Recommend every single one. Okay, we've been talking about documentaries for 20 minutes. I think it's finally time to start talking about something else. It's time to start talking about something awful. I'm realizing now that I forgot to fill my water cup, so this kind of sucks, but uh, we will press on because I don't want to have to do more work in editing. So yeah, we'll press on without water. Uh, today is the 19th of January, a wonderful Sunday. I usually say that during the beginning of the episode, but let's just say at the beginning of something awful because why not? Uh, recently, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but COPA has, the, or at least the, the new YouTube's new mechanisms to handle COPA have been uh, properly installed into the system. It mostly, it is really crazy. <laughs> it's it's really annoying, honestly. Uh, let's just go over what they are. Uh, from the get-go, if a video is tagged as made for kids, it can't be saved to playlists, which is dumb. <laughs> it cannot, you cannot comment on it, which I get, I get that. I mean, I still think it's kind of silly, but comments, I understand because you know people can put like links to um, to like scam sites in the comments, which most like creators have uh, safeguards against that sort of thing, and they ban people who do that. But you know, there's always the chance, and I've seen plenty of, especially like, you know, when I was a kid and I watched a lot of the Diamond Minecart back in 1.5 uh, of Minecraft. There was a lot of people who would like fake Dan TDMs who would be posting like rewards for my subscribers and obviously like a scam link uh, which is why YouTube put in that little check mark next to the names of creators uh, so yeah I got it I kind of get comments you cannot watch a video while um, while it's minimized if it's made for kids that is dumb I have no idea what what that has to do with child safety like literally the way i found out was i was watching a um i was watching a clip from a cartoon network show i don't remember which one i think it was adventure time i was just watching adventure time clips let's just say that and i minimized the video and it stops playing i'm like whoa what happened why it stop and then i say like a notification videos made for kids can't be uh, minimized check the check the thingy thing check the policies and i'm like why why? Why Why is that necessary? How does minimizing a video bad for kids? Like, I really want- Because I went to the link to check if they have like a, a rationale behind it. They don't. It's just a list of stuff. And it's just a list of things that they've disabled, not why they disabled them. Like the comments thing I get, but playlists and minimizing, like what? I, I mean, maybe disabling kids from, like, accessing certain playlists, but, I mean, if you have, like, a, if a kid is making a playlist, like, what's, what's wrong with that? What, what harm could come from that? 
there's no rationale behind behind that uh, feature and the the minimizing thing. Like, there's literally no there's no sentence describing why they did that. I just I just don't understand. They also there's a couple other things that make sense to me. Like I think advertisements are blocked. Um, like and I don't mean like ads like um, monetization. I mean like sponsorships. I think that's what they mean. Which I get that. Or like links to I think links to stuff like Patreon is also disabled. I I, I might be wrong about that, but yeah. Uh, which I, unfortunately for videos for creators who want to like who who want to mark their videos as made for kids and they've already put like links to sponsors and such in their videos you can't really change that so I don't know like how that would be handled but yeah these these copa mechanisms can really be summed up as just really annoying however the good news is that uh, most creators like the diamond like Dan TDM and um, I don't know what other youtubers for kids that I, I don't really watch many videos made for exclusively kids but yeah I'll just use Dan TDM I'm not subscribed to him but I recently saw that he had a baby that's not something awful that's awesome so congrat congratulations to him let's just take a quick second we're gonna go to let's make a uh, improv section something awesome Dan TDM had a kid congratulations woohoo I've been a big I was a big fan of his when I was like really young and I don't watch his videos anymore, but still, that's really awesome. I watched his video, like, about, um, uh, finishing Minecraft Hardcore, and even though that's the only Minecraft Hardcore episode I've watched, the finale, it was actually really hype seeing him get those final achievements and, like, how excited he was. I mean, it kind of, it took me back, you know? But, yeah, congratulations to Dan TDM. Anyway, back to something awful. My point is, is that his videos are definitely made for kids. However, his comments aren't disabled. I can still watch his videos while they're minimized. His videos aren't marked as made for kids. And a lot of creators aren't. There's like very few creators that uh, have marked their videos for kids. Like they, they've marked it like, yeah, this video is made for kids. No, not, I have not seen a single one who's done that. The videos that I have seen marked as made for kids are made by big corporations like Cartoon Network, which is the example I brought up earlier. Or people who are just uploading clips from kids shows and just don't really care about monetization or such. So really, the effects are pretty minimal. Like, it's, it's, not, it's not that crazy. Uh, I, it's not the end of YouTube. It's definitely not the end of YouTube. Creators aren't being, at least right now, they're not being shut down for it. I haven't heard anything about any fines being levied out, but most creators are pretty much safe from harm from COPA for now. Which is good. I still, I'm still bummed out that this is happening. I mean, YouTube has a crisis every few months, I swear to God. Like we had the whole, we had the whole COPA thing. We had YouTube rewind. We had the other YouTube rewind. We've had all of the controversies with more uh, adult content creators. And now we're having controversies for kid content creators. I mean, it's just YouTube. I don't know how YouTube can solve this consistent uh, state of crisis, but, uh, but yeah. That is, that is really all I have to say on COPA. Now, uh, I guess we're gonna move on to my ongoing story slash obsession. Chris Hansen versus Onision, part four at this point. Onision calls the cops. <laughs> So yeah, it sound, it's about what it sounds like. Onision. So what happened was Chris Hansen um, went to Onision for an interview, you know, like good journalists do. Now, I do think it's a little annoying that, you know, to have a journalist bust into your, but not bust into, he didn't bust into his house. Chris Hansen did not break into Onision's house. He just knocked on the door. But um, it's kind of, it, I think it is kind of annoying to have, journalists showing up to your residence. However, I mean, without invitation. But, um, you know, Onision is not exactly the most 
pristine of people, so I, I guess it's a little bit justified. Though I don't I don't really know if it's like looked down upon to do that. I do wonder if it's like a like a thing. Is it expected of journalists to ask for an invite and if they don't get it, they just don't go to do the interview? Or is it like completely uh, reasonable for a journalist to just go to someone's place if they're even if they're denied? I mean, I don't know. I'm not a journalist. But yeah, that's what Chris Hansen did. He went to Onision's residence. Now this does confirm uh, a couple of things. For starters, Onision has a house. If you haven't been keeping up, Onision's, in a couple of his breakdowns, has shown, like, a video of Hotel claiming that we've, like, kicked him out of his house because he's got no money, but, I mean, clearly, which I wish was true. I really wish was, uh, that's true. I wish that Onision was kicked out of his house. I wish he was living in a hotel. I wish he had no money. But obviously, that's not entirely true. The dude's got a house. Uh, not a mansion or anything like that. It's not a real... It's, it's you know, it's a, it's a house. It's no bigger than any normal middle-class Washington house, but yeah, he's got one. Uh, Chris Hansen shows up, he knocks on the door, he says, ah, hey, I just want to talk, and, you know, all that journalist stuff. Onision responds, and I, I kind of bummed I, I spoiled it, but Onision responds by calling the cops on him, and, uh, saying, and the call is, now 911 calls can be accessed, and Chris Hansen's lawyer, because... I guess he brought his lawyer because his lawyer was on scene with him. I don't, I don't entirely know why. Probably because Chris Hansen has big enough, has a big enough brain to realize why Onision would pull something like that. You know, calling the cops. So I guess he brought his his lawyer to, I guess, flex on him. But yeah, he's got um, the lawyer. I looked him up. Can't remember his name for the life of me. I can't look it up right now though. Anyway, so Chris Hansen brought his, uh, his lawyer to Onision's residence, essentially just to flex, I guess, and probably to tell off the cops who might, may or may not show up, which the cops did show up, so it was, it was a good preparation. Anyway, so the lawyer got hold of the 911 call, and it is, it is pretty, pretty phenomenal. He essentially says that some YouTube stalkers have come for him, and he says he does say the Chris Han he does say it's Chris Hansen in like a dramatic voice. I was kind of expecting, I was hoping for the the respondent on, on the call to react to that, but she didn't. Which you know that's good. She's doing her job right. But um, yeah, she was like, all right, I'll forward it to the cops. The cops do show up, and. Um, yeah, nothing bad happens to Chris Hansen <laughs> because he's, you know, he's doing his due diligence as a as a journalist and he's doing his job and there's nothing really the cops can do to him, especially since his big boy lawyer is present. Uh, Chris Hansen has basically said, well, uh, made a video where he says that's basically Onision. We know Onision's response now. The response is calling the cops. We know what you're doing and he basically threatens Onision throughout the video, which is music to my ears. Onision has pretty much played himself. I think he's on his, I think he, the dude is on his last legs. His breakdown videos are an internet joke, as, as they should be. He is an internet joke. It is only a matter of time until we, we can finally say the whole ladies and gentlemen we got him thing for Onision. I cannot wait. So yeah, um, that's the quick update on the Onision story. Whew, man, that was tiring. And I'm gonna have to cut out like a minute of that because I looked up like Chris Hansen's lawyer and I literally said some misinformation. So I'm gonna cut that out. Um, so yeah, anyway, moving on. We have, the reason we have such a short something awful is because we have three things to, uh, to review in the Court of Review. Okay. I got my water. <laughs> um, filled that up nice. I, I'm editing out a section, so I might as well edit just one more section. Anyway, wait, give me a second. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Have you ever had that sensation where you're like drinking water and then like a little bit of it gets caught in your throat and then you need to like cough violently and people think you're like choking or something? Yeah, that happens to me way too often. Anyway, quarter review. Let's talk about, we have three television shows to talk about today. Let's start off with, uh, I think I listed off The Witcher in the intro first. The Witcher, I watched it. I have played the video game sparsely. I got it for sale for very cheap and I played it for two hours and I really enjoyed it. The, and the video game, I should specify, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. I've never been very into The Witcher series as a whole, though it has been, you know, recommended to me many times. I never really got into it. Uh, so I just was like, okay, I, I'm just gonna get the, the third game, even though I'll probably have no idea what's going on. I'm not gonna focus on the story, because I'm not gonna have any idea what's going on. But even though I'm a newcomer, I mean, it was a very, the, the plot was not that hard to follow. I mean, for the first two hours at least, uh, this, the world was expansive and fun to travel through. It was just generally a great experience. I really enjoyed it. So yeah. Um, and, and it's only the first two hours. I got the game quite recently before I watched the show. I think it was only in the last month. I haven't had a lot of time to play video games, so I didn't, and I, and if I'm playing a video game, I'm not playing The Witcher. I'm playing, you know, other games that I really enjoy. So yeah, I haven't played it much, though I do want to play it more. Anyway, that's like established. I'm trying to establish essentially my experience with The Witcher universe. I've not read the books, and I've only really sparsely played one game. So I went into the show with very, with no expectations. I had no idea what to think. I was not expecting this to be, I love Game of Thrones a lot. I love Game of Thrones and I love Lord of the Rings. I'm a huge fan of fantasy. Low fantasy and high fantasy represented by Lord of the Rings being very high fantasy-esque with a lot of fantastical elements to it. And Game of Thrones being more low fantasy with few fantastical elements focusing more on like politics and dark medieval stuff. Both are perfectly fine approaches to uh, making a fantasy universe. I was I was curious where The Witcher would stand. A lot of the critics were compla comparing it to Game of Thrones, so I was kind of worried that it would take a more low fantasy approach. Because you know, in in the books, I've I've I not I've not read, but in the in the synopsises that I've seen, The Witcher universe seems more high fantasy with. With even being compared to the Elder Scrolls in terms of like how much you know how much mystical elements are in there and and Lord of the Rings and A Song of Ice and Fire which is what Game of Thrones is based on and Game of Thrones took out a lot of the more fantasy elements because budget you know it's got a lot of mystical elements to it so I was kind of worried that it would remove that stuff and just not work but I mean those critics I guess didn't know what they were talking about because this show is is nothing like Game of Thrones nothing nothing at all like Game of Thrones in any way the only thing I could like draw in comparison is that their mature rated fantasy shows that's it they're mature rated fantasy shows, that's the extent of the similarity. So if you see a critic going like, this is not the next Game of Thrones, 2 out of 10, don't look at it like that, just don't pay attention to that review, because this is not Game of Thrones, and it's clear that it's not trying to be. If anything, it's more similar to Lord of the Rings, but more mature, I guess? It's really its own thing, it's not even similar to Lord of the Rings in that many aspects, though it it does have a lot of very cool monsters in it, and magic, which I was really happy with. There was some confusing bits, um, it's definitely not a perfect show, I really enjoyed it. Uh, let's just, before I get into all the flaws, I really enjoyed the show. The, the first, uh, six episodes, at least, I was thrilled by. The first episode, uh, it opens up with essentially, like, a flash forward. Uh, I won't be, I won't talk about the story because this show came out recently, but it opens up with a flash forward. And then it goes, and then the whole show is basically leading to that first episode, that flash forward, which I thought was kind of a really weird way to format it and kind of confusing at times, but I think it worked. In terms of, let's start with performance. 
All of the actors are amazing, every single one of them. A lot of people complain about casting for certain characters, but I mean, having very little experience with the games and the books, I really don't care. All of the actors do a phenomenal job. Henry Cavill is an amazing Geralt of Rivia. He plays the character very well. All of the way, all of his little uh, mannerisms, the way he talks, it's all perfect. I, I'm, as someone who's at this point watched the show more than I've played the game, I'm worried that I'm not gonna be able to look at the original Geralt of Rivia, or at least the Geralt of Rivia from the games, without seeing Henry Cavill's uh, character. They, they're very similar, and that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. In fact, I expect that if another Witcher game is ever made, I have a feeling that the character model will be at least a little bit based on Henry Cavill's uh, performance. Uh, the the bard Yaskir, who was not advertised as a main character, is amazing as well. He is the comic relief of the series, and he he the actor gives a very fun performance. I've never seen him in anything else. But yeah, he did an amazing job, and he has got an amazing singing voice. Speaking of songs, the soundtrack of this show uh, hit and miss for me. A lot of the Bard songs are really fun, the ones that Yaskir sings. I mean, Toss a Coin to Your Witcher is like the best song I've heard in a TV show for in a long time. But sometimes the music, um, it sounds like video game music. You know in a video game, how when it's not in the cutscene, like you're just fighting, the music obviously can't sync to what you're doing. The music can't predict what you as a player will do, hence why the music is more like, you know, just general fighting music themed to the fight, instead of like, synced to movements like music in movies and television shows, which is meant to, you know, fit along with the scene. It, it's composed with the scene. The music in The Witcher is like that. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's more like a video game where the music is very general and it doesn't feel like it syncs very well to what's happening on screen. And I might be just overanalyzing a couple of scenes. I, it happened during uh, some fights in the first episode, which I mean, I was I was a it was I was a little put off by that. But in the end, even though the music doesn't sync very well at like. A couple points it's still really good music so you know most people are gonna be able to overlook that and just treat it as it should be which is that perfectly fine I'm not knocking the show down for that uh, on top of that the special effects are are really good they're all amazing I'm kind of worried I'm starting to expect that from shows even though that's unreasonable but the special effects are amazing now let's get into uh, into the flaws, I guess, because that's pretty much all the compliments I have. The, there's a couple flaws with the show. Um, I think when the main one for me is that the last two episodes aren't my favorite. The finale is a little underwhelming, especially since we've had really a, a lot of the finales of each episode, because each episode has its own little arc. Some of the finales in each episode are very underwhelming as well. Episode 6's finale, I was a, I was very let down by. And then in the final episode, episode 8, it had, it had a really great finale. Actually, it had a really good climax, but everything like around the climax wasn't very fleshed out. So it was kind of like the opposite issue um, in episode 8. But yeah, overall... Uh, I think the show, I think the show is, is really, really good. I, I really should get some better notes for these reviews, because I felt like that was a little disjointed. Now I'm criticizing myself. Anyway, overall, get back to it. Overall, I'd rate the show a 7 out of 10. It's very good. It is a very good show with a couple flaws. It slows down in places, and sometimes the climactic moments in each episode don't really land, and sometimes the build-up to that climax doesn't land. But overall, overall, the show is really awesome. Henry Cavill is an amazing Geralt of Rivia, and I cannot wait for the inevitable second season. So yes, uh, The Witcher, the verdict is 7 out of 10. Very good. Would watch again. Moving on to The Mandalorian. Yeah, yeah, I'm late on this, okay? The Mandalorian, I finished it, 
and I finished it a while ago, like, you know, I watched each episode, like, the moment it premiered, like, the moment at night it premiered, I watched the episodes, and every single one blew me away. I haven't been able to talk to them about The Mandalorian since the first episode. Since then, the show has shown itself to be an amazing addition to the Star Wars universe. The best piece of Star Wars media I've seen since a long time. It is phenomenal. I, if you have not seen the show, go watch it immediately. Drop whatever you're doing. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're giving birth. Grab an iPad and watch the show while it's going down, okay? I, I don't even care. It is that good. The Mandalorian is amazing. Every single episode is individually awesome and combined together it makes for a very tightly paced and well done show. The special effects are awesome. Every actor is giving it their all, including like the side character, not even like the side characters, but like random ads are giving their all in the performance. It's just really, everyone's just really fun and energetic or frightening. Whatever they need to be, they are that thing. Uh, the soundtrack is incredible. When, I'm, when you're talking about syncing something to music, The Mandalorian does it with pinpoint amazingness. There are, it's not perfect. Uh, I think there was a couple episodes in the middle where it dragged just a teeny weeny little bit, but that's really it. Like that's the only critique I could possibly come up with. A lot of people I mean, based on like all of the praise the show is getting, you'd think it would be one of those like overrated shows, you know, that the, the show that everyone that everyone loves but really isn't that good. But in this case, The Mandalorian really deserves all the praise. It is truly one of the best pieces of Star Wars media. Nine out of ten. Watch it right now. I don't even care. All right. Finally, moving on to my to my final big blockbuster TV show. Crisis on Infinite Earths. Okay. So, those previous two shows were on streaming services and had a lot of budget behind them. Crisis on Infinite Earths is on the CW. It is the event of the CW DC Arrowverse, which essentially ties in Arrow, The Flash, Supergirl, Batwoman, all these shows, Legends of Tomorrow, all these shows come together for a big event called Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is based on a comic book of the same name. Now, I've not read the comic book, and while I really like The Flash season right now, uh, the other shows, I'm just kind of underwhelmed. Batwoman was kind of a turnoff for me. And while Supergirl shows some potential in the next few episodes, uh, the back, the first half of the season was kind of an eh. It's like a meh season. But, Crisis on Infinite Earths. How was that? Well, I've got to say, while I levied high praise for the last two shows, I am a little, a little, disappointed with Crisis. There are a couple issues that I take with it. For starters, I was hoping for something as grand or even more grand than their previous crossover, The Crisis on Earth X, which saw our heroes of all these different shows fighting against Nazi versions of themselves from uh, the appropriately named Earth X. Now, that crossover had some incredible fight scenes, uh, including like one in the streets of Central City with our heroes going against an army of Nazis. There was a fight inside of a warehouse, which sounds boring, but it was so epic. There was a fight inside of a church while the Flash was getting married. That was also super awesome. Just every single uh, moment in this show was just so phenomenal. Or not this show, this crossover. And now when we come to cr the Crisis on Infinite Earths, the Crisis on Infinite Earths is supposed to be the big thing, the end game, the final moment, you know? This is supposed to be the DC Arrowverse version of Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. And I think it's, it's really on me for setting my expectations a little too high. I wasn't expecting Endgame, but I was at least expecting something on the level of Crisis on Earth X, which had these very grandiose fights 
this sh uh, crossover really struggled with that aspect of it. I think the fights in this crossover were incredibly underwhelming on multiple occasions. However, the thing that really made it wasn't the fight scenes, because like I said, those were really underwhelming. A lot of them were, um, were very plain and bland. They were all during... I don't mind fights happening during the daytime, but I, I don't know. I think I, they're, they're just... None of them are very dramatic. It all feels a little bit too plucky for something that's literally called Crisis on Infinite Earths, you know what I mean? They were they were just very bland in general and and very very uh, very small scale for something that should be the biggest event in in comic book television history. But the thing that made this crossover, like I said earlier, because I I said the but a little too early, I needed to like elaborate on my fight scene critique. But but the the thing that made this crossover wasn't the fights; it was the cameos. There were so many amazing cameos. Uh, we had the original Robin from the uh, Adam West the Batman. That was amazing. Like, an old version of that Robin. He even does one of those, like, stupid quips from that show. Like, that, that was, that was amazing. We had the original Flash from the original live-action Flash show show up. And he had, like, a final moment of glory where he sacrifices himself to give the heroes a little bit more time. That was amazing. We had a cameo from Ezra Miller's Flash from the DC movies. That lit the internet on fire because of how awesome that is that the Flash from the CW shows and the DC movies can meet. I mean, that is... That was really cool. I mean, we just had a lot of really amazing cameos. Some of them uh, were cool in theory, but ended up being less cool. I'm looking at you, Batman. <sighs> yeah, the Batman that was introduced, the Kevin Conroy Batman. Conroy is Batman for me. I mean, really, there's there's no one else that I think could could be as amazing as his Batman. He is... He's like, he's like Christopher Reeve is for Superman. He is Batman. Because, you know, I grew up with the animated Batman shows and the Justice League show, which he, he features in. However, in this crossover, he's like an evil Batman, which that was a little disappointing. And, you know, with Batwoman getting such a bad rap, it, uh, it didn't help. <laughs> but... To, to like alleviate that issue. But like despite that, I mean, I really didn't care. There were so many cool characters here and cool cameos made that I just, I couldn't even list them all. There was, there was ones from the DC streaming service, like the DC streaming service that made appearances. That was really cool. Like Doom Patrol. I mean, I didn't expect Doom Patrol. I don't think anyone expected Doom Patrol to show up here, but they did. I mean, it was just really cool. Lucifer! Lucifer Morningstar from the Netflix Lucifer show slash, uh, I think he was on Fox for a while. I mean, he shows up and plays like an important role. Who expected Lucifer to show up and talk with Constantine from the Constantine show? Like, this is getting way too crazy. The crossovers cameos were by far the best part. The story itself was, you know, pretty basic. God save the infinite earths. Uh, it was it was fun. There was you know there were there were sad moments. There were happy moments. I really think that what the show was lacking was not the show. The crossover. This is multiple shows, but the crossover was lacking was epic moments. We had fun moments. We had surprising moments. We had sad moments, but we didn't have anything epic. There was no portals scene. You know, there was no hero march. There was no cool thing like that. There wasn't a moment that made me get goosebumps and stand up and cheer or anything like that. And I think that's what this crossover was severely lacking. And while that's only one aspect of what makes um, an event or television show or movie great, it really affects this particular um, this particular crossover because it's supposed to be just so epic and climactic. So overall, I'm going to rate it a tenuous 6, 7 out of 10. 6.5. 6.8? Close to 7. Maybe even 7. S something around there. 6 to 7 out of 10. That's my verdict. On Crisis on Infinite Earths. And yeah. 
All right, we just reviewed three television shows in, in straight succession. I think it's about time that we wrap this up. All right. If you guys enjoyed this episode of the Crispy Cast, make sure to leave a like. If you want to see more podcasts and videos by me, please hit, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And finally, let my me, oh, blah, 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 blah. I can't talk. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. In essence, like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you all next time. Farewell. <laughs>